go. Well, Hubs, thanks Ready. so much for uh, jumping on the show, mate. Pleasure, Tom. Yeah, good, good to be uh, here, son. Yes, yes. It was very, very spontaneous. We did well. We we're like, all right, let's do it. When can we book it in? And we're off. Here we go. Here we go. I'm strapping in and holding on. Got my hot chocolate. Got my computer. Very good. I got you. Yes, I'm you got me, mate. I'm putty, I'm putty in your hand, son. Let's go. I love it. So I guess for everyone um, who isn't aware of your work, um, maybe give us like a brief description, um, maybe kind of tended towards the, the U project. How would you get into all this sort of stuff? Uh, wow. So I'm old, so that's a big story. But You told me you were 24, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done it hard. Look at me. Yeah. Um, so the U project is... Um, uh, kind of just a culmination of lots of stuff. I worked in radio. I worked in telly for a while. I really like um, this format, talking with people, learning, um, spending time with interesting people, having good conversations, listening to their stories, telling stories. Um, and so I actually built a studio at home downstairs from where I am now so mm. I could just, you know, explore that and... I stepped away from radio about a year or two ago because I think it's for a range of reasons, but it's probably not going to be around that much longer in its current incarnation. Yeah. But, you know, my background is working in the fitness industry. I'm an exercise scientist by qualification. I opened Australia's first personal training centre in 1990. I started in fitness in 82. I'm 56 now before anyone tries to figure it out. Um <laughs> So I've spent my life, you know, and I've written some books and I've done some other stuff and I've opened, I've run gyms and owned gyms. And, but most of my background is working with people one-on-one -on -one or, you know, the last 10 or 20 years, more groups. But for a long time, one-on-one -on -one helping people change, think better, do better, do different, create different. How do I change my body? How do I change my habits? How do I change my thinking? How do I change my lifestyle? How do I change my external reality and my internal reality? What's the relationship between the two? And so my podcast, which is The You Project, was really just something that was born out of all of that. And when I started, it really was probably a bit like you. It was just a passion project because I wanted to share thoughts and ideas and stories with people. And, you know, we spun the wheels, the wheels for quite a while. And yep. that was actually my fourth incarnation of a podcast and it's really in the last six months it's kind of last year but the last six months it's kind of really gathered some momentum and we've got some big sponsors on board and it's turning into a thing but you yeah. know you just grind like I do we do um give or take 150 episodes a year and you just work and you grind and some things work and some don't and you try stuff and you know you step up and you fuck up and you dust yourself off and you go again and you know, so for me, the U Project is just really um, having a, a format to share thoughts and ideas and stories with people and hopefully genuinely help a few people along the way. So my main job in inverted commas these days is, I guess, coaching and corporate speaking. Yeah. And I do, you know, probably 100 corporate gigs a year and I'm also doing a, PH, a PhD in neuroscience. So Beautiful. Um, I'm at uni doing a bit of study. So it's a work-study combo. You know, yeah, there's, there's so many things I want to ask, but I guess um, what struck me most then was your interest in neuroscience because that's something that I'm very interested in as well. And you mentioned before, um, you know, getting people to change is, is just, you know, it's such a superficial thing when you say it like that, but it runs so deep. And I'm interested to um, hear your thoughts about what you're studying um, in terms of what's going on the brain when it comes to, you know, change, motivational systems and, you know, how we respond to pleasure and pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the way that this came about for me is, you know, the one thing that everybody has that in common that goes to a gym or a trainer or a dietitian or a coach or a counsellor or whatever, you know, somebody who's in that space or similar space is that they want to change. Yep. And so nobody nobody pays a coach or a counsellor or a trainer or a dietitian or a psychologist because they want to stay the same. And so for me, I spent a lot of years writing programs for people, exercise programs, anatomy, physiology, movement, biomechanics, adaptation, sets, reps, volume, progression, overload, 
all of this physiological stuff. And I kind of got to the point where I thought, I'm pretty good with bodies and I know how to write programs and I know how to talk about the, the science of changing a body, mm. but I'm not great with humans. <laughs> I'm okay with humans, but this person is not, it, it's not actually a body issue quite often. It's a psychological and an emotional issue yeah. or a decision-making issue or a self-talk or a self-esteem or a self-loathing um, issue with a physiological consequence. So mm-hmm. I always say people don't accidentally eat cake. You know, we don't accidentally not exercise. We don't accidentally have 32 beers. And yep. so, you know, in life, I think with everything, there's a psychological, emotional, depending on your belief system, spiritual, sociological, physical component to all of it. And and so the ongoing, I guess, challenge for everyone, you included, me included, <clears throat> is trying to self-manage. Yes. And so a big part of that, obviously, is the brain and the mind. Um, how does that work? Why do some people with lots of ability underachieve? Why do some people with not much ability relatively absolutely kill it? What's going on there? Why do some people step into their fear? Why do some people run from it? Why do some people waste their talent and then a switch goes off, then all of a sudden they use all of their talent? Like what's happening? And so for me, the the cognitive stuff is fascinating because it's it's what drives our life. You know, so I always say to people, your your mind is UHQ. It's your operational headquarters. Yeah. So this is the place where decisions are made, stories are told, um, you know, reactions are born. And, and it's, you know, this is our internal data processing center to our external world. Yeah. And it's learning to understand, for me, you know, an area of fascination is metacognition, which is just thinking about thinking, essentially. And having an awareness of... <clears throat> not just the world around me, situation, circumstance, environment, but the story that I tell myself yes. about that. And there's a big difference between what's going on and, well, there's often a big difference between the, the practical reality of what's going on and the story that I'm telling myself. And so it comes down to a lot of times, you know, how do I manage me in the middle of the unmanageableness, you know, and that fascinates me. And so that's why you know, neuroscience, neuropsychology um, is trying to figure out how the brain works, how the mind works, how we work, and to help people more in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And I really want to pick your brain on this. I knew we were going to go here. And, you know, what I love about neuroscience, because you, you, you read a book like Effective Neuroscience and talks about what's going on in the limbic part of the brain, you know, how we respond to fear, how we respond to a desirable future, all this sort of stuff. Where neuroscience um, kind of gets me is that that idea that, you know, we get how these systems affect behaviour. How about you take this drug and then all will be well again? You know, we can, we can change things so that we can pump more dopamine or we can, you know, lead to those things because you mentioned something very profound at the end there which is the narrative that you tell yourself you know and I think that so much of change you know even as I'm sure you can just say within your own life change is about you know how we unpacked our layers of awareness and came to those you know defining moments and we were observing ourselves and be like you know this moment really changed me for the better you know that adds that significance to the narrative of our life and I I was wondering to get your thoughts on that because you know if we look at the brain just as a brain like okay we'll take this and then you sort it it kind of removes the it, it erodes the autonomy of the human being to be like well no this is why I changed you know oh you're bringing up Issues, big issues, free will, who's making the decision, <laughs> where's the decision coming from, am I Are the captain God, of Hutch? my own? <laughs> What's that? Are you a God? Tell me. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely not. You know what? The, the, here's the thing, right? We are not psychological. We are not physiological. We are not emotional. We are not sociological. We are not spiritual. We are everything all of the time. Mm. And, and I, you know, like the thing is that, I can say to you right now, perhaps not right now, but in a different, you know, say you and I were just mates having a chat and I said, hey, Tom, I don't want you to panic, but there's a bloke standing at your window with an axe, right? So don't turn around yet, right? All of a sudden, I plant a seed in your mind 
the seed is bullshit, but I tell you a story, you believe the story, and then all of a sudden the biochemistry of your brain changes like that. You haven't taken anything. Yep. There's no actual threat. What I'm telling you is not real. Your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. Your, your sympathetic nervous system starts to switch on. Your endocrine system produces adrenaline, cortisol. Nor all this shit happens because you created a biochemical response with a thought. Yes. Right? And this is the thing. I believe that I'm not... Of course, and by the way, I'm not a doctor or a pharmacist, so this is just a PhD student talking, right? right? This is not advice for anyone. But, you know, for me, I'm very hesitant to medicate anything or anyone um, unless it's absolutely necessary. And there, of course, there are times when, of course, it's necessary. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I, th I think for me, this sounds, I think we're probably on the same page, but I'm way more fascinated with the, the, the pharmacy that is my brain mm. and, and the, the drug that is belief. Yeah. You know, when, when I have, when I believe something for good or bad, it's going to change my state. It's yeah. going to change my physiology, you know. When I think I'm in trouble, my heart rate goes up, not because I'm in trouble, but because I think I'm in trouble. So these physiological responses are created by my mind unintentionally. And I think this is, you know, it's like I've worked with lots of elite athletes, blokes in prison, corporates, government. But one of the things I learned working with AFL clubs and racing car drivers and Olympians and stuff is... What matters for them specific to their sport, but this is transferable to life, is not how smart or talented or trained or gifted or fit or strong they are necessarily, but how they can use that all under pressure. Mm. How, how well can you do when you're stressed? How well can you perform in what we would typically call a stressful situation? And so that's, you know, that whole idea of equanimity being the calm in the chaos, yeah. which is how do I manage me? Because I think one of the mistakes we make, this is me just talking shit, Tom, shut me up at any <laughs> stage, but I think one of the mistakes that we make in general in personal development and professional development and motivation and self-help is that we need to build this fucking amazing life and this amazing job and this amazing bank balance and Mm. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But for me, most of the time, if something needs to change, it's not so much my situation, circumstance or environment as much as it is me yeah. in the middle of that. And so it's helping people because when, when I'm different, my world is different. Yeah. When I'm different, my life experience is different. Mm. I can be in a relatively shit situation and be the happiest guy ever, fulfilled, calm, curious, excited, but I'm not in an awesome situation. Conversely, I can be living in a palace looking at the ocean and I'm on three different medications for anxiety and depression and I hate my life and hate myself, right? So there's our, you know, the, this whole, uh, I guess, idea around how do I manage the totality of my existence, which is my external world and my internal world because where I really live is here. Yes. I live here and I live here. Yes. And it's, it's trying to learn how do I manage my mind and my emotions so that wherever I am, I'm okay. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, what you're saying before about the pharmacy of the brain is so spot on, you know, like uh, anything that induces a neurochemical change is a form of medication. You know, like one thing I love to live by is the fact that the dog that we have is the best antidepressant I've ever had. Like I'm not depressed, but I'm just like filled with a sense of joy whenever I walk in and see, you know, the embodiment of unconditional love running at me. Um, so you, you spot on. I was interested. You said, um, you know, how do I manage? Can I say one thing about that? Can I yeah. say one thing? This is, e this is even more interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm like you. I love dogs. Yeah. So if we ever meet, I definitely want to lie on the floor with your dog, <laughs> right? Absolutely. But, but here's the thing. If your next door neighbour hates dogs, they're going to have the opposite reaction. Yes. So it's not so much about the dog as it is your relationship to 
or feeling about or belief about dogs. It still comes from you. It's your response to the dog. I'm like yeah. you, mate. I love dogs. I reckon dogs are probably the best medication of all for most people. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of that, a lot of the reason why I love the dog is because I grew up with dogs. So it's very much, you know, it's very much ingrained in my subconscious that dog means good, dog means home, dog means family, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you're talking about being able to manage your internal environment, um, how do you, like, how, how does that look like for you? What does that come down to? A lot of people talk about, um, you know, Nietzsche said, you know, uh, he who has a why can bear almost any how. So for him, it was like a sense of purpose that enables you to mediate life no matter how stressful it is externally. So um, what is it for you? That's a good question. So I guess for me, it's largely about self-awareness and it, it's about recognising so in, in this is very broad science, but in, in the science of self-awareness, it's often categorized in two areas. One is internal self-awareness, one is external self-awareness. So internal self-awareness is, you know, what's going on with me? What are my thoughts? Even, even what's my physiology doing? How do I feel? Uh, what's my self-talk? What are my ideas? Am I depressed? Am I happy? Am I, it's, it's kind of that internal awareness of where I am at mentally and emotionally is, but then there's another one which is, uh, it's called different things, but I was reading an article today, in fact, um, where, they, where it's called external self-awareness, which is having an awareness of what it's like being around me. So yeah. what's the Craig experience like for others? Um, what's the Tom experience like for others? And for me, um, it's very much about managing, because I spend my life talking and coaching and teaching and all that. So it's a bit of both. It's about I need to make sure that, that one, that I'm living, probably the most specific answer to your question is that I'm living my values, right? Yeah. That's, that's when I'm in my best place. Yeah. And what are my values? Honestly, my values these days are more about, you know, giving than getting. It's more, it sounds cliche, but it's about how can I serve others? I tried the yeah. getting rich and making money and buying fancy cars. I tried that. I did that. Right. I did that model. And I was, you know, wealthier than I should have been probably and wealthier than I thought I would be by the time I was 30. And I wasn't a squillionaire, but I was very comfortable and very successful. I had five businesses and wow. 100, 100 staff when I was 30 years old, give or wow. take. And life was good. But in the middle of all of that external success, which none of that's bad, but in the middle of all of that stuff, all of my picture of success I was an overthinker, I was full of self-loathing, self-doubt, didn't love myself mm. and there was lots of shit going on because all of my focus was about essentially building this idea of success, right. this, you know, representation. And I think that sometimes, and by the way, in the middle of my, you know, and same with bodybuilding, I went down the bodybuilding route where all I wanted to do was be massive because I was insecure and get money and drive that and live there. And I did all that shit and I was still, all I was was a bigger, richer dickhead, you know, <laughs> and in the middle, right. that's all I was, right. you know, but, but it's because we're all flawed. We're all fearful. We're all insecure. We're all overthinkers and none of that is bad or terrible or weak. Mm. That is all human. Mm. And once you get through the bullshit and you go, okay, uh, this is literally what I did when I was about, maybe 35, so 20 years ago, I went, okay, I took 10 days out of my life, my very busy life. I went to Queensland. I didn't take a phone, a computer. I didn't talk to anyone for 10 days because I wanted to figure out what I wanted the rest of my life to look mm. like. Because in the middle of my success, I felt very unsuccessful. Right. I was stressed and anxious and borderline depressed. And I thought, wow, I've done all these things that I was meant to do, apparently, and I've ticked these boxes and, you know, I've got these biceps and I own these, you know, I'm driving that and living there. And I, I kind of knew that it wasn't, I, I, you know, of course I knew that that wasn't the panacea, but at the same time, the way that I lived and the way that I executed was lopsided and I right. needed to try and 
as cliche as it sounds, go away and figure out what I wanted to be doing for the rest of my life. Mm. And so I had a lot of epiphanies and it's hard to find clarity and perspective when you're in the middle of mayhem. Yeah. So I often say to people, if your life or your body or your situation or whatever, your, even your mindset is somewhat chaotic or not where you want it to be, and I know it's easier that said than done, but we're talking about your life here. Yeah. Try and find even once or twice in your life, try and find even three days where you go away by yourself and you do not talk to another human. Yeah. And you just think about, is this the trajectory I want to be on? What are my values? What matters to me? Does my behavior, my lifestyle, my results, relationships, words, is it a reflection of what I really value? Mm. Or am I just living the program? Am I just on autopilot? Am I living unconsciously? Yeah. Because living consciously, I believe, is where the joy happens. Yeah. It's where we open the door to a different kind of wealth. So I do, you know, three years ago, in fact, I stopped coaching people for money because I felt guilty. I go, I don't want to charge. I, companies pay me lots to speak. I go, that's enough. Right. So I stopped co coaching people for money because it didn't fit with my values. And I got so busy that I kept putting my hourly rate up to the point where I felt awkward, but they would still pay. I'm what? like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know? And so I don't train, co coach many people these days because I'm busy, but, but I still probably see three or four people a week, but I don't charge anyone a cent wow. because for me, and I'm not suggesting anyone else does that, for me, that's what works. Yes. That's for me, that's what lines up. You know, I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. I'm okay. I don't need, I don't need more money. <laughs> I don't need more money. doesn't mean, you know, I don't have a business or I have a business. I have a full-time PA slash business manager and all those normal things. But honest to God, my, my, my priority is top 20 money wouldn't be, money would be number 20 maybe. Yeah. It's a resource. And so for me, it's all about, it came down to, and I know I'm talking way too much, but it no. just came back to trying to figure out who I was beyond all the things I thought I was meant to be. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, so the book I'm writing now is actually called Behind the Curtain, Cultivating Conscious Awareness. So it's interesting that, you know, you brought that up in that light. And I wanted to know about, because, you know, you say that, you know, an existential crisis, this sort of stuff is so cliche, but cliches are, you know, true for a reason. It's because, you know, at some point in life, we are all, like I went through mine um, at 24, you know, I'm 26. How old are you? How old are you? How old 26. Are you? 26. So, You're 26. Yeah, yeah. Fucking yeah. hell, my shoes are 26. <laughs> well, mate, uh, I need some spare shoes actually, so I might come around. <laughs> um, you know, but I did, like I went, you know, and we all do. We go through this process of just, you, you almost come to a point in your life where the, the absolute, it's either massive self-reflection or just chronic depression or, or suicide. You know, it's like mm. something I'm doing isn't working and I have to just dissolve into myself. So for you, it was 10 days, um, you know, before, before I really come out again and have a think about, you know, what the next step is. But it's, it's, it's such a different process um, for so many of us. And it can take years or months or some people, like you say, can just snap and be like, oh, I need to change and then change. I was wondering if you could almost like inform the audience of what um, some of the common themes around change involve. Um, I think that, you know, here's the dichotomy. On the one hand, we say we want to change, do different, be different, think different, look different, produce different. Um, and that's, that's quite typical and normal. But also what's quite normal is that we want to be comfortable. Yeah. yeah. So there's a dilemma because change is for the most part, at least for a while, uncomfortable. Yes. And so... You know, it's like people would, many times people have asked me a question about how do I do whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them and I would see their energy, the energy drain out of their body <laughs> because what I'm telling them, they don't want to do. Yeah, yeah. They want, they want the result, they don't want the work. They want the pain without the pleasure. They want the destination without the journey. 
Yeah. And so the truth is, the not very sexy truth is that some things are just really fucking hard. Yeah. The end. You know, it's like we would, I think we're talking off air about how many podcasts I've done or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or was it on air? Like this is my podcast, The You Project. That's the fourth version. Like I did three that failed. And now we're into, I guess, our fourth year of doing podcasts per se. And I've done just with my, you know, 100, nearly 70. And we've done hundreds and it's now just, it's starting to work commercially. Yes. Right? Yeah. And there was lots of, and it cost me 35 grand to set up a studio. And I never got one cent back forever. And you know, it took forever to get a sponsor and lots of them were shit house and trying to get guests. And, but it's like a four year journey to get to the point where now it's kind of okay. Yeah. But it's like, even when I talk to people about podcasts now, everyone wants to set one up yeah. and be a podcast star by fucking Tuesday. <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, like it that. depends if you're already got a massive profile that might happen. But yeah. And it's like doing a PhD. It's just arduous. It's not yep. fun, quick, easy, sexy, or painless. It's it's getting in shape. And so the change process is very much about, one, recognising clearly what you want. And Simon Sinek, Sinek S-I-N-E-K, talks about the why, yep. why you want it, because that's actually what you want. That's your actual driver. So one and two. Three is what's the cost, because everything comes at a cost, right? Yeah. So the cost of, say, for example, me at 55 to go back and do a PhD is three time, three years of full-time study. Yeah. So that means the guy with a cushy, comfy lifestyle now drives to Monash University, which is 30 minutes away every day and sits in a cubicle for about five to eight hours. Not fun, yeah. not joy, whatever. That's the cost. And I'm okay with that. Yes. But you have to be a, like, is, if that's the outcome you want, that's the price, mm. you know, but we overthink it. And, and so there's, and then there's just that willingness to be resilient and be okay with, you know, making your way and fucking up and getting up and fucking up again and getting up again and being okay with failure. You know, yeah. I did a podcast with a girl called Lola Berry recently called Fearlessly Failing. And we're just talking about this is where we grow. Mm. You can't build like most people. If I say, do you want to be, do you want to be more uh, mentally and emotionally um, empowered? Do you want to be more resilient? Do you want to be? Everyone goes, yeah, fucking oath. Yeah. Well, how that happens? How that happens is you work through the shit. Yeah. How do you build muscle in the gym? You work against resistance. That's the whole idea of progressive overload and resistance training. How do you build mental and emotional strength and resilience? by working against resistance. And so for me, it's like there's the idea of change and then there's the practical process. Many people are enamoured with and in love with the idea, but you go, right, step into it. And they're like, no, it's never the right time. It's never the right day. You know, yeah. And then they wake up and they're 40 yeah. or they're 50 or they're 30 or whatever it is. You know, Because the truth is that you know, time's really about Time's fixed, but time's also about perception. And Mm -hmm. I I know this might sound melodramatic, but I always say to people, in a minute, you're going to be five years older. You're going to wake up in a minute and you're going to be 31 in a minute. And, and, and And I'd say to you, what do you want your life to look like when you're 31? And you'd go, I want this, 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 this. I go, awesome. So what needs to happen now? Yes. What decisions do you need to make? What action do you need to take? What things do you need to acknowledge? what things you need to learn, what things you need to unlearn to get the wheels turning, to create the momentum, to tick the boxes, to do the things, to make that five-year idea a five-year reality. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, one thing that I really clung on to, because I I went deep into spiritual teaching, because I was very interested in how other parts of the world across different times and cultures, um, you know, thought about, the proper way to live life and there was a really um just a poignant sentence in the Bhagavad Gita just a, just a Hindu book and it just said you know something on the line I can't remember it specifically but something on the lines of like you know dharma so good meaningful work is where the the fruits of the work are in the work itself you know so you're not attached to the outcome so it's like a Buddhist idea you're not attached to the outcome but you're attached yeah, to the, love of the work itself you know and 
you know, doing what you would, what you have done with all this work and going back to university, getting in the trenches and, you know, four rounds of a podcast, you know, all of that shit, you wouldn't have done that if the work itself wasn't actually what you wanted to get out of it, you know? So it, I think, um, and for me, it comes down to like how we see the world and how we see our society because, it, you know, it doesn't take you that long. You travel to other parts of the world and some of these people are happier than anyone you'd ever meet in the Western world, you know, and they have nothing. And like we have this very bizarre defining metric of success, which is related to finance or is related to happiness, you know, but none of that stuff because happiness is so transient and success when it's financial is so temporary. It's kind of like, you're always by definition going to be clinging to the next thing. But if you can find a belief system or a value hierarchy, <clears throat> excuse me, in your life that's predicated on, you know, meaning or good work or, or discipline, as you said before, um, you are going to be able to get up mm. every day, you know? Mm. Yeah. And we, I mean, the thing is that we grow up, part of the challenge I reckon is, we grow up in a collective mindset that says success is. Yes. We're taught that success is stuff. And essentially, the more stuff, the better. Yeah. So success in our culture, not, I mean, I'm just talking as a broad generalisation and, of course, this doesn't apply to everyone or, you know, but we're kind of taught that it's success is about what you have, what you own, what you earn, what you drive, where you live, what you look like and what people think of you. Yep. All things external. Yep. And that's not to say that any of that stuff is bad. But when we get our entire sense of self and self-worth and identity from things, external things, we will always be insecure, which means we'll be miserable mm. because all those things can be taken away from us. Yeah. <laughs> so when you get your sense of self from something that can vanish, of course you're going to be insecure. But when you get a sense of who you are from the inside out and not the outside in, then it's a different experience, right? Mm. So the challenge I say to people, you know, one of the things I do when I talk to execs or I coach people is I go, tell me about you. And what they do invariably is they tell me about their job or their house or their location right. or their bank balance or their schooling or even their kids. Or all this stuff that isn't them. Yeah. Or their habits. Oh, I smoke too much. I'm an accountant. I played, you know, all those things are good, but none of those things are who you are, right? Yes. Tell yeah. me who you are. And it's like, we don't even know. I go, I don't know. Yeah. I go, well, so you smoke. Are you a dirty habit? No. Well, why'd you tell? What? <laughs> I'm, I want to know who you are. Yeah. Are you a job? No. Are you a bank balance? No. Are you a a reputation no so where do you live like what what's you know maybe you live in your values what are those and people yeah. go oh uh what are values yeah you yeah know? and so and i'm not trying to be too weird or deep but i i think that you know when from when you know zero to seven zero to five depends on what research but you know we're just programmed and so you know, when I grow up and dad barracks for Carlton and dad votes liberal and mum and dad are Catholics and I go to Catholic school and there's a fair chance I'm going to vote liberal but be a Catholic and barrack for Carlton. There's not yep. much chance, almost none, I'm going to barrack for Collingwood, vote Labor and be an atheist by the time I'm 10. It's not yeah. happening. Yeah. So we become a byproduct of our programming and yeah. we are always, even now, you as a 26-year-old, me as a 56-year-old, we're still being programmed by our situation, circumstance, media, social media, government, newspapers, friends, family, music. Like we're constantly being, you know, like what do we have, 70,000 thoughts an hour or something like that, allegedly 50, depends on what you look at. But, yeah. but we're always absorbing stuff. And, and the challenge for us is to, to find physical, mental and emotional and perhaps spiritual space. Mm. You know, to the that whole you know equanimity being the calm in the chaos mm. is just trying to is trying to be that. You know, when am I still? And for me, I have to be. So no distractions. No, you know, I'm not doing any. I need to find at least ten, fifteen, twenty a day where I'm literally doing nothing. Yeah. Not looking at something and relaxing. I'm not looking at anything. 
I'm not thinking about, I'm not planning, I'm not being strategic. Yeah. I'm not singing, I'm not listening to music, I'm just paying attention to what's happening. Yeah. And it might just, I know it sounds, might just be my breath, but, but we are so chaotic. And so it's, you know, in the middle of the mayhem, the challenge for us is because everyone's busy, right? Everyone's yep. busy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but sometimes we're miserably busy and sometimes we're happily busy. And I think we equate, we wear busy like a fucking badge of honour. It's insane. It's like, well, okay, you're busy, but you're miserable. So fuck busy. Yeah. Like where does joy and happiness and contentment and purpose live? Mm. Oh, yeah, but you don't understand. Like, and we tell ourselves stories. And so, and we all do and I do too. But, you know, I think this is just, this conversation is opening the door on how do I be more conscious about like when I asked you that five-year question, people mm. often look at me like, oh, my God, that is a really good question and I don't really think like that. And I yeah. go, but so your current is not what you want, right? And they go, no. And I go, well, it's not going to accidentally end up awesome. So what's the strategy? They don't have one. Yeah. They just hope things will get better. Yeah. I go, well, that's the worst plan ever, champ, because that's not a plan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. not a plan. No. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna accidentally stumble into Nirvana. Yeah, that that was the big uh thing for me. You know, I was constantly asking myself, you know, what is the meaning of life? And then exactly the way you just said that right then. It's like you're not gonna pick up a rock on the beach and go, Oh fuck, there's the meaning of life. You know, it's something that you have to create. And I will often meditate. This is gonna sound weird, but it sounds like we're on the same playing field here, mate. So um you know off weird. We're yeah, we're both, right, weird. <laughs> both wearing glasses. Um, I'll often meditate over the idea that all the people I love are dead, you know, and then I'll meditate. Wow. Yeah. That's dark. Yeah, but it gives me a sense of perspective. It's like, you know, was I conscious when, um, you know, my girlfriend left the door? She's a breathwork meditation healer, so I've got no um, excuse not to do some form of breathwork meditation, you know. Um, we're actually going to head off very soon and do it. <laughs> But, um, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And I think um, something that came up for me just before when you were speaking about how bombarded and perceptively busy we are is, like, how many of our thoughts are actually ours, you know, as opposed to the thoughts that then dictate our behaviour that just come in because we saw a fucking jingle on an ad, you know? Mm, mm. I'm so glad I've persuaded you into swearing. Well done. <laughs> you got me. I know. I was trying to be educated at the start. Sound educated. I'm bang. I'll be dropping C-bombs by the end. <laughs> please, please don't. Yeah. yeah, look, I think that, you know, we are, you know, we're sponges and you hang around with somebody, you become a version or of that person. You know, it's like whatever that, I don't know if that's real research, but we become the average of the five people yes. we spend the most time with. But, mirror neurons, but mirror neurons. Yeah, but definitely, I, you know, I always say to people, hang out with people who drag you up. Yeah. You know, and for me, it's, I'm very selective about with my personal time, so not, not business, not work, not coaching, but in terms of my time away from my role and my job and my responsibilities, I don't hang out with anyone negative at all, ever. Yeah. So I, I culled all my negative friends. Yeah. And this sounds harsh but I don't care. I don't want negative bullshit. Mm. And so my litmus test is that doesn't mean I, I don't care about them or I, I hope they're great, yeah. but I'm not having energy vampires in my life. Mm. And so my litmus test is for friends. I'm not talking about family or acquaintances or, you know, people we have to work with. I'm talking about optional friendships. I go, is my life better with this person in it or not? And if the answer is no, you know, I don't send them a memo, but I just, <laughs> I just slowly disintegrate that contact and that over time because, you know, it's, I don't want to spend time with people who pull me down. And, mm. and I spend so much time in my work having hard, deep, uncomfortable conversations with people and, and my work, I love my work and I'm very grateful, but it can be very consuming and very draining because not too many people rock up where everything's awesome. Yeah. So there's a lot of work and it's and I'm all cool with that, but but away from that, I want to have experiences and conversations and relationships with which make me feel light. Yes. Not heavy. 
Yes, that's such an important lesson, mate. Um, fuck, Hart, I've got to get you back on for round two, mate, because I just reckon we could just go down this four-hour rabbit hole. We'll just um, pump the coffee in and it'll be great. Well, mate, any time, just let me know. You go and do your breath work and your <laughs> fucking whatever you're doing with your missus. You enjoy that. I will, mate. I will. Uh, but before, we, before we leave you, Hart, where can people find you? Uh, just come over to my house. It's in Hampton. Uh, Beautiful. No, I'll swing around. So my, my website is craigharper.net. So there's lots of resources on there, videos, audio, craigharper.net. My podcast is The You Project. Yep. You can follow me on Insta at Whiteboard Lessons and Facebook and all the other shit. You'll find Brilliant. it. Yes, mate. mate I promise well you. done. Keep doing what you're doing. You're a champion. Enjoy your breath work. Enjoy your girl. Enjoy yes. life. We'll talk again. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Up. Talk soon, mate.